Looks like the almighty God of the Bible has a taste for blood and surprise. He apparently doesn't look like what most of us would expect the creator of the universe to look like. I mean, who would have thought that the all-powerful, all-knowing God described in the Bible as having a human-like form with a penchant for sacrificial mills? Talk about a curveball. It's like finding out that Santa Claus is actually vegan. You're awesome. <laughs> um, so God's being so concerned with food. This is something as well. But before we get to that, Ezekiel and Genesis, this is something I thought was fascinating because I always read the Bible as a Christian and always thought Genesis is the beginning, Revelation yeah. at the end. It's, it's written in the chronological order in which they were really written or something because you just, you're not told all these things. But you mentioned about this um, in Ezekiel, you know, it talks about this, this king, this ruler who says in his heart, which is like where you think in the ancient world yeah. of Oregon or your heart, which is down here is actually where you think, not your brain, but we're not going to go there. Cause I think you said that <laughs> plenty of times on your other episodes. I really want to get something unique out of you in terms of this. So I will rise above the throne of God. I will, I will, I will yeah, I will sit upon. Yeah. He wants to so ride, written, go up the holy mountain and sit on the throne of Ale, the high God. Yeah. Yeah. And th this was written before Genesis is account. Or Genesis is Genesis. Yeah, so it's kind of complicated. So the story that we have in, so basically Genesis 2 and 3, the story of the expulsion from the Garden of Eden, it's not a fall, it's an expulsion, um, has a lot of similar motifs to a lot of material that we find in Ezekiel. And in that that material in Ezekiel is probably older. Um, so it's, that's probably, you know, kind of 6th century, but drawing on an older motif, whereas the material, the story that we find in Genesis is probably about 5th century. But what both are, but kind of, they both share the same mythic kind of schema or trope in which you have this, um, the first human who across ancient Southwest Asian mythologies, the first human was generally understood to be a paradigm of the king. And the king was understood, you know, the role of kingship, because a lot of these texts and myths were produced within royal high status contexts. So the first man is the, the paradigmatic man is the royal figure, the king, who is made and appointed to perform various tasks on behalf of the deity in the earthly realm. So the Ezekiel myth does talk about an anonymous ruler who, in the context in which we find the myth, is probably to be identified as one of the foreign kings that's harassing Yahweh's own people, like an Assyrian king or a Babylonian king or, or possibly an Egyptian king, but probably Assyrian or Babylonian. And he says, you know, I will ascend the holy mountains, phone, I will make myself like a god. I will sit on the, the throne, on the seat of the gods in the divine council on the top of the holy mountain. Um, and God, who here is, is the terms used for God are both Ale and Yahweh. Um, he's like, no, you're not, I'm not having this at all. I'm going to, you know, you're going to die like any mortal. You're not a god. You know, one of the kind of qualities of, of, of divine nature in some ways is kind of, perpetual immortality so even if like bar you die you, you don't die forever you don't stay dead you you know you come back so yeah this king is expelled from this holy mountain which in ezekiel is also called eden it's this beautiful garden of god he's expelled and sent down into the underworld where he obviously dies and then his corpse is is um, exhumed and trampled by enemies so this is about kind of wiping him out in every possible way in the ancient world you only exist for as long as you're remembered so even after death, you have a post-mortem existence and you continue to have a social relationship with the living. But if your tomb is de desecrated, if your bones or your remains are destroyed, if you're eaten by wild animals um, and shut out on the ground, that basically is completely eradicating you in a material sense. And therefore, you no longer you can no longer be remembered and you, you no longer exist. So that's what happens to this king. But yeah, it looks like a lot of that, that myth that we find in a way, that Genesis material and the Ezekiel material are both later reflections of, of what looks to be an earlier kind of mythic trope about one divine or semi-divine figure trying to usurp an older, more senior divine figure and, and kind of being taken to task for it. I, it just always excites me to learn this stuff. Um, mm -hmm. What about the gods and food, right? So they're always concerned about food and not eating their food in the ancient world. Or mm -hmm. says God's being so concerned with food and not you, humans, mortals, eating their food in the ancient world. Did temples, did the temple's demise change the understanding of God eating in Jewish thought? So I kind of wanted to like get the idea, you know, we're talking about him being a corporeal deity who needs to eat. Now yeah, he doesn't I have mean, food. 
Yeah, exactly. I mean, because we have, when we use the language of sacrifice in our own cultures today, we have the sense of that it's something like that we're giving up something, um, you know, that it's hard for us to give up something. It's something very precious. But but sacrifice in the ancient world, I mean, you didn't just sacrifice living things, you know, animals or the humans sometimes. Uh, you could also sacrifice all the other things that were that were important and sort of the mainstay products of human consumption. So you can sacrifice wine and beer and honey and oil and bread and fruit and cakes. Um, and so sacrifices in temple economies were a way of um, not only getting money into the temple, um, but it was a way of sharing a meal with the deity. So say if I was a worshipper, actually, let's say you, because um, this is what we talk about very masculine as kind of culture here. Um, if you wanted to go to the temple um, because you want to petition the deity for a particular kind of blessing, um, you might take, I don't know, a lamb or a couple of pigeons and you would take these to the temple. The priest would sacrifice it on your behalf. And then some of that food would be burnt on the altar as, as, as food for the deity who would smell, was constantly told in the Hebrew Bible that, that Yahweh is attracted to the, the sweet aroma, the pleasant aroma of sacrifice, kind of like, Kind of, you know how like when you can smell the barbecue and you're like, mm, God, that smells oh, really yeah. good. It's like that. It kind of so it calls the deity into this social relationship around the altar with humans, and so the deity would eat part of that sacrifice normally, and then the priests and other ritual officials and would eat the rest, and then you would also get a little part as well. So you're kind of sharing in a meal with with the deity, and and this was a way of basically forging and maintaining a social relationship with the God. So just as the same way that food times, like meal times, are important social family occasions for all of us, you know, think about the great, you know, the big festivals that we celebrate, whether it's Thanksgiving or Christmas or whatever it is, you know, food and, and a particular kind of feast is a, is a focal part of that. And that's because it's about this sense of bringing a community, a group of people together, you forge and maintain social identities and relationships. And that's exactly what, what temple sacrifice was about. As far as the eating that really caught my attention, you did it really well in making me think of something I never thought about. And that is God just got done flooding all humanity. Let's forget that there's earlier Mesopotamian myths that really give us the precedence for why this is. And they kind of give you a different reason in the biblical account, getting God off the hook for just being annoyed uh, for noises and whatnot. But, but here is like this complete genocide of the human race and here's this one guy he finds is like, well, you know what? I like Noah. Okay. And his family can have this little group. Noah gets the barbecue up as soon as dry land comes up mm. and God smells it. Yeah. And is, is, am I correct in assessing this and saying God was ready to eradicate all. And then he smelt that meat and he said, why did I kill all these humans? It's not I so much that he said, yeah, it's not so much he says, why did I kill all these humans? Because within the kind of narrative arc of that story, mm -hmm. and obviously that story in gen between Genesis 6 and 9 is drawing on all sorts of different other traditions. So it's been kind of edited and redacted and shaped into a kind of a narrative. But within that narrative frame, you've got the sense that God's not pissed off. You know, he doesn't regret. He regrets that Earlier, he, you know, he floods the world because he regrets having made humankind because they have become so corrupt, mainly through having sex with, with divine beings. But that's, <laughs> that's another story in Genesis right, right. 6 that we can talk about. <laughs> but so when he smells the smell of the sacrifice, of Noah's sacrifice, it's then when he says that he decides that he will never again flood the earth. And not just he will never again destroy humankind. He will never again destroy living creatures. So it's a kind of a covenant, a, a relationship, an agreement with non-human life as well as with human life, which I think is, is quite an important theological point given the state of the world and the climate crisis at the moment. It's quite an important point, you know, for these kind of particular Christians who think that the earth is ours to, to exploit um, no matter what. I, I think that's a really important theological point in those particular traditions. About as far as the food goes, though, because they're so like he's butthurt about Adam eating this fruit. Like it's it's obvious that food is so important in the ancient Near yeah. East for the gods. So I kind of wondered if like that sacrifice he made to God, what made an impact wh where he kind of has this like I've I've starved before, like where I'm like feeling like I'm dying and then a, a fresh plate of barbecue comes before you some really fresh cooked meal and then it's like i am thankful for everything 
Like I am willing to start over a fresh start because that food was everything to me. I wondered if that food played that kind of role in God's mind of like, you know what? Man is continually wicked. His heart's continually wicked. It says in the context there. So I'm thinking it's like, you know, uh, you know, tomato, tomato, you know, like, look, you made me some food and I'm really, I don't know if that made him convinced that he didn't want to do this. I anymore. think, yeah. I mean, I think because again, within the narrative arc of the story, this is the first sacrifice that's offered. I mean, yes, you've got Cain and Abel offering their sacrifices in Genesis 4, but then that whole generation, you know, so that's pre-flood humanity. They've been wiped out. Noah is the only one left. And so this is this is the first kind of bonding moment, that new agreement with the new humanity that is going to, you know, stem from Noah and his kids and their families. And so, yeah, it's exactly that thing about sitting around a table and this idea of forging intense relationships um, social relationships that that's exactly what's going on with that sacrifice and it's you know and it is he smells the pleasing smell and it, and it pleases God he wants he wants sacrifices so yeah then fast forward to the destruction of the Jerusalem temple first in the 6th century BCE and then again in um, 70 CE um, the the loss of the temple for those scribal communities who are producing a lot of these texts the loss of the Jerusalem temple was huge and so the the when sac the temple's not there, if you can't sacrifice, then that does necessarily shift theologically the way in which you might understand those sorts of offerings to function for the deity. Mm. 